um, uh, meeting, um, discussion. So it's nice that you're here, Quinn, Patrick, thank you for coming, and Le, it's great to see you. Um, and it's good to know that we're, we have Kevin as a friend in common. Um, so um, I'm going to, um, and also thanks to Far for inviting me. Um, you know, I would naturally, I'd prefer to see everyone in person, uh, but in the absence of that, we're here in the mediated space, the electronic space. So welcome to the electronic space. Um, and I'm gonna begin, I'm gonna do, uh, I'll begin reading a couple poems. Um, and then after that, I'll, I prepare to talk in a way, um, not like a straightforward essay kind of talk, but in a way, a, a, um, an essay that bends into a poem um, in some ways. Um, and I'll move in to that shortly, um, but I'm gonna start and read a passage from um, uh, Magnetic Equator. This is from a chapter called um, Alterity. And I, I like reading this from this section because um, very little of the writing in the section is my own. Um, much of it is drawn from short stories, novels, and poems written by authors from the Caribbean, the Antilles, and Latin America. And so my involvement with that writing was more um, kind of as a, as, a, as a pattern shaper um, or perhaps a conductor, um, bringing together the different voices and guiding their interaction so that they spoke together across oceans, geographies, and histories. Um, so the first section of Alterity assembles the opening lines from an anthology of Latin American short fiction um, so that the story is always beginning, always at the beginning, never progressing beyond that original moment, never allowed to progress so that a smooth and linear narrative can never emerge. And if one does emerge, it sort of looks chaotic in the way that it just immediately cycles back into itself. So from uh, Alterity, the chronicles of Itaguay relate that in remote times, at the auction of a circus that had gone bankrupt in a region of South America that had never been visited by white men, Mercado Viejo, turned velvety with ash, as even in the peaceful world of plants, Major Aranda suffered the loss of a hand in a social revolution that took July's motionless brambles. A couple of years ago, Don Pedro Damian shouted to his wife, who was upstairs a few nights earlier, with one of the priests who were so richly dressed that the men touched them to see if something strange was going to the sea when the lookout blew his conch to announce that the 50 black ships came, as I recall, at the end of September to the brick floor of the cell, a dutiful, orderly man participating in the tumultuous finale with a pianist passed into a coma just beyond the gray stone bridge my father dropped years ago Moonlit by the Argentine central siesta, a wave moved ahead of the others, past the white gate in front of a newsstand. A wave entertained the hope of finding the news vendor holding out the change for the frogs riddled by El Lampino's bullets. In the depths of equatorial Africa, when the stranger arrived, quite out of breath, at the metallic village, where savage sewer games shatter infinite fists in unending breath, in deserted complaint, uninhabited for 20 years, arrived quite out of that Montevideo afternoon, on the outskirts of winds chasing one another, the French explorer, hunter, and man of the world, the story of a great slaughter, when I was a very small pygmy, when the first children who saw the dark and slinky bulge approaching through the sea were still an old couple next door hanging their I don't know and their ideas in the palms of hands where someone crossed the night, dug his nails into a meteor and said, years ago, between the peaceful world of plants and the silence of an indifferent earth, 50 black ships swelled within me, 
and dreams of gold charged the horizon. Quel avenir connaîtrais-je? Celui de mes frères et sœurs les esclaves. I was then four years old and saw my world as vulnerable, as a far sail trembling under the gong, and saw through volcanic courses, myself as a soldier facing the port of mourning. My first act of ingratitude arrived with the men on the coast, a procession of messengers, drums tuned to a different pitch, sharp, swift, and the vessels drawn up at my feet, swollen with nothing, ribbed for hoarding, for loading, mourning, molten between myself and eternity, between gold, good, and bad, between the loss or gain of lime, coffee, cashew, between the journey que les Anglais venaient de m'arracher alors que le navire faisait voile, between soldiers and, exhausted, having received, 250 coups de fouet sur les jambes, les fesses et le dos. Every morning, I became a soldier who could not be kind. Every morning, I rejected my heart of hearts. Every morning, I blazed between my life and eternity. Every morning, the impending departure of the ship swelled within me. Every morning, I stamped my newly shod feet. Bragadon, I beat my heels into the grung. Bragadon, I planted my father's thunder. Bragadon, I received the earth's revolution. Bragadon, from the bottom rung. Mon cœur se gonflait de fureur et de révolte. Every morning, flowers flashed in the sun. Le feu glorieux, le feu qui dévore et calcine. Every morning, the British Empire hungered and groaned within me, and a sense of despair, a life in my hands, a limp flesh clutched and wrung, a shadow dripped across an ocean. Son ombre s'étendit sur moi comme un génie protecteur, a shadow dreaming of small stones in my mother's abdomen, in the hands of a Carib woman, small stones shot from les fusils du blanc, small stones swelling within the intrigue, small stones whose skins glistened, small stones pierced with arrows, small stones of raw commerce, Small stones blinking at the first beam of dawn shot across the curve of the burning earth. Small stone eyes seeing the world as dew. Small stones skidding through surf. Small stones scattering into pelicans' wings. Small stones spinning in Afric in Arawak skulls. Small stones percussing chants. Small stones sparking in darkness. Small stones of ackee seeds carried under the tongue to flourish their future against Babylon. Small stones who marooned. Small stones of mountains, raisin de la colère. Small stone shuttles, drumstick tips, ne peuvent pas nous tuer, elles glissent sur la peau. The captain's toy fleet glisse sur la peau. In the fine sea spray. In the gust of the town day, the years lead to the front door, past de longues et lourdes siestes à l'ombre des manguiers, toward a brave morning on its way. So the questions have always been the same. Where is the beginning? Where does the story begin? Do we ever get to the beginning? Or is that point of origin forever obscured? Is that origin underwater? A transatlantic surgence? What is the original utterance? What is the language for me? What is the form for me? What is the pulse? What is the language for my experience? Why am I here? How do I sound? Is anyone listening? How did I get here? How did my family get here? Why do I sound this way? 
how much of myself, of my language, of me, is the wind roaring in a sail or the grains of sand between a person's teeth? How much of my history is in the waterfall, is in the water, is impossible to recall? How much of me can be called out to but cannot respond because that part of me is somewhere mixed with the wind and the water? And if I have these English syllables to retrace my steps, if I have these English syllables to make my waves, my meaning, to fling at the skyscrapers on the prairie and at the emptiness of existence in a place like where I grew up in Western Canada, I want those syllables to burn with noise. I want that noise to be lit and licked by the same vexed spark that ignited my darkness in Alberta in the 1980s, when a person like me was what? Like me was who? Like me was nowhere. Like me was nobody. Like me was noise. Like me was something incomprehensibly different. Like me was drifted in on another world. Like me was bent grammar. Like me was that or other. Like me was. Like me was curly-headed static that shocked the curriculum. Like me was that presence that haunted but couldn't be person. Like me was couldn't really exist here among who? Like me was that noise. Like me was following that famous line from Kamau Brathwaite that reads, the hurricane does not roar in pentameters. Like me was following into the hurricane. Like me was the geography and language of this particular existence. What I mean is that I'm aware that black life and black music have often been referred to, been dismissed as noise and being smack in the middle of the hip hop generation. I remember hearing those dog whistle dismissals on rock radio, on talk shows, in the popular culture and media. And what I mean is that I'm aware that those same dismissals were made of black music and black speech and black life before hip hop was a thought. I am aware how vast and how old that category of noise. What I meaning is was not meaning in any familiar way. I wasn't in the curriculum or the textbooks or in the teacher's unfresh mouth. I was in the classroom, yes, but my presence was distortion. It hissed and fed back. It balked at every single teaching every single omission and gloss over, every gap, every elision, every historical inaccuracy, every whispered parenthesis, every subtext and footnote, every margin and interlinear space, every spelling, the accent with which every word was spoken. But at the same time, I had a story, a history, a record of ancestral experiences and distances traveled. I could point to a map and say, look, there, there is a world outside Canada, outside the United States, outside suburbs and two car garages, outside this pathological whiteness I come from. I come from that outside world, even though I was born here. Right there on the northeastern tip of the South American continent, Guyana, Georgetown, where my ancestors arrived in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries from Africa, Portugal, Hong Kong, where my name comes from nature and the language of the original inhabitants. And when I trace I self back through indigenous genocide, through indenture and enslavement, forced migration, stolen life and labor, I and I and I and I go back a long, long sentence. I and I and I and I speak across distances. Even though I had a story, had a world to which I was connected. I was still noise, but there was narrative in that noise. There was love inside that noise. There was family and culture in that noise, in the noses on Blackwood masks that hung in our home, or in the prints of South American indigenous cave paintings, or in the words of the West Indian poets of my grandfather, C.B. London's bookshelf. That noise made sense. I understood its sound, I knew its hidden meanings, the way a strips of the teeth might indicate weariness in one moment, curt dismissal in the next, agitation, 
impatience in yet a next. And in that noise, only in this culture was it noise, but in the culture, but this culture was the one I was born into. And in that noise was I, was meaning, was love, was being, was history. And in that noise was Caribbean and black people still. And into that noise was where I had to go. I had to listen into the noise in order to understand my place in it, in order to understand how to place one word in front of another until a poem got made or until a story broke open and babbled out from the page. And what that noise is for me, drawing upon a personal relationship to the sense of noise is being, is nourishing, is informing this language. That noise is the narrative for me. I don't hear stories or hear the poem in any other way. So how does one articulate noise? That is the question that brings us back. And we ask, where is the beginning? Where does the story begin? Do we ever get to the beginning? Or is that point of origin forever obscured? Is that origin underwater, a transatlantic submergence? What is the original utterance? What is the language for me? What is the form for me? What is the pulse? That question, how to articulate noise, how to understand it, how to sit with it and shape it, is embedded in the question about how to be articulate, how to be properly hostile with English on the page, because no passage should read nice and smooth. No passage should say what someone else demands it say. No passage in subservience, no passage in a sense that doesn't include this message, this passage, my passage. That noise is also about who communicates, who is speaking, and who is being heard. That noise is also about whose perspectives become prominent and whether it should be possible for any perspective to come to dominance. It is about an ethics of perspectives and how we think of, as one editor once put it to me, a hierarchy among narratives. An anecdote about that hierarchy. I used to contribute to a musical collective many years ago. They're still running, they still um, play, although not now during the pandemic, they're called the Community Vibe Collective. And this was like way in the, in the early aughts. Um, uh, we were all younger and the music was younger, I guess, in a way. And um, um, we played at a, at a cafe in Little Italy called Sablo Cafe. It was a very small venue. Um, and on any given night, there might be like, you know, six or more musicians on stage um, and uh, one mic, and there might be 10 vocalists, you know, vocalists with verses, bars, hooks, harmonies for that one microphone. So you can imagine how much hot breath that microphone absorbed, how much humidity and dampness that, that, that microphone absorbed, how much humanity that microphone absorbed. Um, and there were always some kind of improvised rhythms that the band would play that everybody wanted to jump on, every vocalist wanted. That was the rhythm. And um, yet not everybody could have that rhythm, right? The rhythm didn't belong to anybody. Nobody could, could claim it, nobody could own it. And we all had to share it. There was only one microphone and so much aspiration. Um, so we had to share that microphone and we had to share that desired rhythm. But then when we heard other rhythms that we didn't necessarily perhaps like as much, uh, that didn't grab us in the same way immediately, that didn't speak to our personal aesthetic as directly, um, we would have to think of ways to adapt to those other rhythms and articulate ourselves over those other rhythms and to invite others to share those rhythms with us. And so when I think of that hierarchy among narratives, and when I think of that um, um, sharing of perspectives and that articulation of self, um, you know, one of the things that it brings me back to instantly is um, contending for that one hot microphone um, at Sablo Cafe all those many years ago. Um, yeah, and that's what, uh, that's what I was thinking about. So, um, you know, I often think about um, uh, 
I kind of took this as an opportunity to, to, to start writing a little bit about noise um, because I, I think about noise and it's um, what it represents and uh, it's the sonic possibilities alive in it and how it, um, how things that we think are noisome, um, once they become familiar, they're not as noisome. Um, how noise is a category of unfamiliarity sometimes. Um, and um, yeah, so I, 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 I have to thank uh, Far and Quinn for the opportunity to start thinking a little bit more in a slightly more formal way about, about that. Um, and um, hopefully it will um, develop in the future. So thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, there's a lot to think about there already. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I guess at first and foremost, if there's any response or questions from our audience, uh, I could open the floor to that, but also I'm down to also just continue a dialogue sure. here between us. Um, yeah. Um, it's interesting that you talk about, like, I think immediately just thinking about the anecdote that you had about the, your time with, with community in the start and maybe, I don't know, like just to, what came to my mind as I was hearing about that is I'm wondering which opportunities to, to drop your voice in you think, maybe it, you didn't appreciate one over the other, but I'm wondering if, if you found that there was a quality to one of those, to the instance where you, where everyone, like I can, I can imagine that kind of beat that really aligns with a lot of people's drive and and what they're looking for versus the beats that might be more interesting for the musician to play or, or just are happening anyway, um, despite not really connecting immediately to the, to the spoken word artists. And I'm wondering in comparing the two of those in just the end of your of your presentation just then, um, do you prefer one over the other? Is there a preference of one over the other or a sort of, uh, or is that just, are they just two different? Well, you know, with, sort of with, with uh, the early community days, it was like um, a lot of us had, had Caribbean backgrounds, right? So, um, and had been, had loved, you know, dance hall music and reggae music. And, and so when those rhythms came around, um, when some of those roots reggae rhythms came around, those were the moments that, that, you know, really spoke to a lot of us culturally. And those were the ones that really sort of, sort of instinctively, almost in spite of yourself, called you to move and, and called the words up out of you. Like suddenly you would hear that, those rhythms and then you would have something to say, you know, even if you didn't have anything to say on the previous rhythm, uh, that might have been, I don't know, some kind of funk rhythm, Minneapolis funk from the 80s or whatever. Um, you know, you you would like, when those ones came around, suddenly a whole bunch of people would have a whole lot to say. Um, um, but suddenly, you know, it would, it, would, it would touch upon a kind of internal groove that you had that had been furrowed over years just by hearing it, you know? You'd mm -hmm. internalize that. You'd internalize that passage and that groove. Um, and so there was a familiarity there. Um, and I think it was that, that cultural connection um, that, uh, that some of those rhythms um, made that made uh, so many people just, you know, respond to them immediately. And, you know, they would also connect a lot of people in the room, right, in the audience. And Savlo was this interesting I was talking about it recently with a couple of friends. It was this interesting um, performance space because it was like a, it was a cafe, right? It's right on the corner of Saint Dominique and Saint Zatik. I think it's like Gigi's Pizzeria now or something. Um, it had these big front windows that would um, fog up. And so they'd push the tables back and the front windows here, uh, looking out onto Saint Zatik Street uh, would be, um, uh, or these are, let's say these are the front windows standing up. Saint Zatik Street is where my head is. Um, and this is the cafe. And so there'd be this little space here, which would be the performance space. And then you have drums, um, bass, guitar, you know, keyboards, three horns, percussion, percussion, and then like 10 vocalists squatting down on the floor over here. Um, and it was really compressed, as you can imagine. There was a PA 
with one mic and it would, we would sort of mix things all right off the floor. So it wasn't like, um, you know, it wasn't a professional mix, right? In any way, like the levels were off, right? Things that should have been loud were maybe quiet and things that were quiet, um, you know, should have been loud. But, you know, I think it was, they did a decent job at Sabo of, of mixing it, but it wasn't, it was a raw, rough mix. And then there was like a, a little narrow space for the vocalists to, to, to come and strut in. And then the audience was right there, right? So when you got on the microphone, um, there was this band sort of um, like roaring right at your back. And there was an audience right in front of you. So there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of pressure and excitement um, and fear uh, every time you took the microphone because you wanted it, you wanted it, and then you got it and then realized what you had to contend with. Um, so everybody kind of also wanted that ideal rhythm that would allow them to, um, to showcase their skills. We had to share it. Right, right. Um... This will probably read as a bit of a, of a like just direct interpretation from my end on some of the like themes and aspects of, of what you write about in your work. Um, but I, I'm just thinking about it because the, the picture that you paint of, of the performance venue, um, you know, being so compact and, and the fog on the windows and sort of the pragmatic aspects of um, how your how the setup of the cafe was and how that sort of informed the event and what happened at the event. Um, I find it interesting in a lot of, so maybe this is just gonna be me asking if you if you feel like speaking to this or maybe I'm off base, but some of your work, um, or when you're talking about sound in the way that you write about sound and, and as a sort of fixture in what you're talking about, um, it always seems to have that very like sort of sensed uh, tactile element of like feeling in the body, um, sort of the body as a node. I'm trying to remember if I can think of a specific poem or phrase or something that speaks to this, but um definitely in, in one of the stories in dominoes of the, of the crossroads yeah i know you talk about there's like a, a a line going from the atmosphere into the skull of someone's head um and so i think that's it's sort of an image at least for me when i'm reading your poetry and and um your short stories and, and where the relationship with sound as a as a sort of ethereal vibrational thing going around um and the body is a, as a physical element same with with an environment having the sort of the remnants of 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 human contact with the humidity and, and, and sort of what you're talking about with the humidity on the mic um so maybe this is me rambling at this point but i'm wondering if if that's something that you recognize or want to speak to or if that's close to how you interpret your own work or, or your own interest in, in where you or the interest that you put into your work um maybe i just spat at you some no no, no. i mean i i do uh, <laughs> but before i answer that i just want to ask patrick mm. um it's night where you are yes it's uh, uh, I, i'm mm. in stockholm so it's uh, okay. 10 o'clock in oh. the evening so <laughs> 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 so so I, I i've seen some of your uh, some of your stuff on youtube and some uh, live things like this uh, before so i'm i'm sort of stalking you i'm sorry for that but but i really enjoy your work and uh, uh, i even I, I work as a librarian at stockholm public library so i i i i have uh, they were not so hard to convince i i talked to the um, uh, unit that uh, purchased books so that uh, they should buy some of your books for our patrons so it's it's uh, coming up Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, th thank you very much. And the first time I, the first time I encountered your uh, beautiful work was in the magazine called OAE magazine. Oh, here. yeah, and yeah, it, yeah, yeah. And it was mm -hmm. both in English and in Swedish, so it was yeah. very enjoyable to read it in original, but also to, to, uh, to, to read it in in Swedish translation. Otherwise, I would have enjoyed to to do it to try to do the. The, the translation myself, but uh, OAE is a really good magazine, and yeah. it was you it's together good. with some other Canadian uh, poets. So it it seems to be a very interesting theme seen in Canada. I, uh, uh, so I have also a question that you can take later on if you if this yeah. scene is if you are sort of encouraging each other and um, sort of inspiring each other because I saw something fresh when I 
when I read your poet, it was very materialistic and it's very, it was an openness that I haven't seen before. Thank you. Yeah, I can answer that too. I'll answer that um, quickly. And then, uh, you know, one of the, well, I would say that um, uh, the poetry communities here, well, thanks for reading in OEI um, and, uh, uh, and, and continuing to look out for my stuff. I pre really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, the, Cana the Canadian poetry communities um, are small. You know, um, Canada is a small country that's very spread out. And if you spend enough time in those communities, everybody sort of knows everybody. Um, and um, even if you don't know people directly, you know of them and of their work. Um, and social media has just made that those communities, we really see how connected they are. Um, because I remember thinking that they were much broader than they were uh, before social media existed. And then when it came into existence, thinking, oh, they're a lot smaller and more intimate than I thought. But one of the interesting things about the communities too is that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of poets who are not, who are brilliant, but are not popular. Um, so there are a lot of poets who have, over the years, produced some really fascinating work, um, very challenging work, um, who are not part of the conversation right now and who are not fashionable right now. Um, and um, that is one of the peculiar characteristics of the Canadian poetry community. Um, that, uh, yeah, that, that, there's a lot of work out there that just doesn't get discussed, that doesn't get talked about. Um, so I think that, you know, even though there is that intimacy and that, that closeness, there's, there's a lot more beyond that too. Um, but there is also a lot of cooperation. There's a lot of competition. It's very competitive and very aggressive. Um, and, um, um, but there's, there are opportunities for cooperation and it depends on how, you know, a lot of poets kind of approach things like, oh, it's, an individual art, um, but then it's nice when you have poets who think of how their work interacts with other texts and um, how they interact with other writers. Like in OEI, I think it might've been Erin Moore was one of the people who was translated and uh, Nicole Razia Fong, those are the other two. Erin Moore is brilliant and she's, uh, she's a translator herself. And so she's always interacting with um, other people's work and she's a very supportive uh, and encouraging presence. Yeah. But Quinn, to answer your question um, about, about sound, um, I, I, as a writer, I've always been, I guess, a bit envious of musicians because they can make um, their art form makes sound. Right? And that's one of the reasons that I've been over, have over the years been so attracted to the world of performance and musical collaboration is because, um, you know, writing is silent and it's static on the page. Um, it speaks to the mind's ear, but it doesn't actually make a sound. Um, and uh, it's, you, can, you can suggest sound and you can suggest movement on the page, you know, by the way you space your poem out. And I guess the eye moves from left to right and down the page as you read, but uh, the text itself doesn't actually move on the page. And so music is just, by contrast, it's just so dynamic, it's sonic, it's embodied and physical. I mean, I'm sure we've all had those, that, that experience where you walk into a live, performance venue and a live show and you know you feel the music and the the density of the crowd and the music like a small venue when it's packed with people and there's band playing or something like that um and you feel the the immediacy of the music you feel the pulse of it um you feel how it just can vibrate right through you um and that physicality is um really wonderful and really welcome um it's not something that you can experience in I mean, there are a lot of writers who talk about the, 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 the body of the text and the embodiment, how writing is embodied and it's so physical. It's not physical in the way that like a really um, involved sound performance is physical, right? Like sound comes out of your body and you, it's, it's, it's air and breath and body and heartbeat 
and um, uh, and that physicality and that exertion. Um, one of the things I, I I love those things, but I also love the way those can be disruptive, um, and those can be disruptive to um, uh, a kind of genteelness and a politeness and a quieter sense of respectability that kind of you, you find in the literary world, right? A kind of a sense of quiet literary respectability. And then you have the exuberance and intensity of, of performance, the rudeness of it. Um, uh, you know, there's so much that, um, it's just a different, different way of expression, different levels of intensity that you can reach um, in a performance. And, and, um, a different level of uh, a different kind of immediacy because performance is so dependent on presence and and sound is physical right like it moves through the air in waves and those waves can touch you. Um, so there's a, 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 a an intimacy to it as well. Um, yeah, I mean I also spend a lot of time in a room with a guy who plays a bass saxophone so the saxophone is huge, you know it's, it's like gigantic and it's really loud um, and when that's played and when you're in conversation with that instrument, um, the sound, um, it, it, uh, it really has a, 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 an incredible physical impact on you. It, it, it takes all your senses and it, um, it, it travels through your body, you know? Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. No, definitely. I think that's a wonderful way to talk about whatever I was, I was uh, interpreting. Um, I'm also, I'm very, very happy that we were able to facilitate a connection with, with Sweden. That's very exciting and had no idea that a uh, far reached that far. <laughs> um, so thank you for, for that as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for that response. Um, for those who um, are also just joining us now, we're, we're doing a bit of a Q&A for the tail end of uh, our talk today. I delivered already a, a pretty stellar uh, poem slash essay. Um, which should be, we'll be able to make available on our YouTube page for a time, um, just for also other people who weren't able to make today. Um, yeah, I think maybe to, to just to bring the conversation around to the Canadian poetry scene and, and how you, you just talked about that as well. Um, I've been really interested in thinking about um, how like I, I, the the aesthetics of your work are are very they seem to be informed again talking about sound and and sort of a maybe a, a hip hop um that's a kind of basic way of putting it but uh yeah hip hop like um sort of remixing and and sort of I don't know if that's if that's something that you identify with or maybe it's just a, a my own reading of of how you write poetry but I I'm curious about the the emphasis that you put on um on that kind of the the sound and the and the 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 the, the quality of, of of sound as it's remixed and sort of put through that additional kind of technological medium um radios static that kind of thing and how that sort of informs what the sound of your work might be gesturing to or thinking about um especially as we're talking about like being well maybe that's i'll, I'll start there if that's like sort of something that you find your work is trying to speak to, um, maybe um, if um, that makes sense. Well, I'm like yeah. sometimes, but not always. Mm. I mean, I like I like those techniques of being able mm. to plot something and um, to to like to um, to sample something and remix it, uh, or to um, mm. you know to to um, thoughtfully and carefully appropriate something and and um, reshape it and redeploy it. Um, I like that what what that does. I like being able to have, um, you know, I'm a big fan of collaborative of work, collaborative work just through working in performance and working with mm. sound and musicians. And so it's nice where those when those collaborative moments can um, enter into the writing process, right? And um, I always I think of of that, uh, having that conversation with other writers whose works I like, whether they're alive or not, as being in a way a kind of collaborative act, uh, collaborative engagement. Um, 
you know, but at the same time, it's funny how some influences might just sink into you because of your when you were born and what was going on in the world. And like I was, you know, I, I was um, born in 1975. So by 1990, I was 15. By 2005, I was 30. So that's, that's, that's really the timeline of the early timeline of hip hop in popular North American culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, so at every kind of, as I, as I was in my early, very early adolescence, like it would have been making an emergence into popular culture. Um, but you know, bands like Run DMC and their collaborate, their crossover collaboration with Aerosmith, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and other things like that, like it, at the Beastie Boys at that time, and then you know the Native Tongues, gangster rap, all that stuff. Like I remember seeing that stuff happen and seeing hip hop move from an art form that was more or less underground to one that came to dominate popular culture, right? So, um, and in the earlier days, um, those techniques of sampling were, were, were being discussed very hotly. Um, the legality of sampling, mm. um, the value of sampling as a musical um, tool, is that music? If you're just taking somebody else's baseline, well, then are you even making the music? Is that even music, right? Um, the, you know, all kinds of the ethics of sampling, um, uh, you know, they hate the, he just took the whole song and then rapped over it. That's not even music, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, and so, I mean, I listened, even though I wasn't, I was never like a huge hip hop head, my brother was. So I heard a lot of music through him and I, I remember listening closely and to and thinking about those discussions and debates about whether, you know, sampling uh, was music. Um, and so who knows, perhaps some of that, um, I mean, those debates also took place within the popular culture, right? So we were all, um, we heard them. They formed part of our, um, at least for my generation, our sense of what, I mean, those were, those were a curious moment because there were discussions of, in popular culture about what art was and what it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and um, of course, those discussions also happen to touch upon race and class, uh, but those were, that was like a, a moment of a kind of introductory discussion to what, um, what art was, um, what it could be and what art could do, how it functioned. Um, and so there, even though those discussions were maybe carried out in a really clumsy and, and um, uh, often accusatory way or, or, you know, they were nonetheless interesting because they touched upon those broader aesthetic questions, um, philosophical questions about the nature of art. Well, sweet. Thank you for, for speaking to that. Um, yeah, that, that was, yeah, I think definitely like uh, just trying to think about um, or like, like, thank you for indulging me on that, my sort of reading potentially. Um, I've just been thinking, I think your work does a really wonderful way in like, I think a, a just the dub structure generally, like it having a, a sort of broken down text and, and things like that, um, potentially evoking the, the sound quality of hip hop sort of just really creates this very clear form for like um, what, Canadian poetry, uh, I think, sort of gestures to sometimes or, or oftentimes um, in racialized writers when we're, we're trying to, you know, take sources and imagine sources coming from very far flung places and from all over and sort of, I just found interesting thinking about that um, being a, a quality of Canadian poetry on a thematic level, but then formally it sort of complements um, the form of hip hop and remixing kind of complements that um, sort of the making do with 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 sources come ten minutes left and uh been yeah ten minutes left I, I don't know if anyone else wants to ask a question or chime into the conversation yes um yeah um I had one a few questions but um it's really like what you were saying about like having an ideal rhythm or especially like just hearing you speak that like the vocalization of the Kind of the progression of that poem um and the integration of french and other languages like within um it's really interesting because um what you're saying about like remix or what quinn is saying about remix um that like language and the languages we're embodying or like in 
bedding our sounds into reflect that a lot and it's really fascinating because like Japanese for example it's really remix um or like the structure of like I'm speaking from a design perspective because like that's where I'm coming from but um like the visual poetics of like the structure of Japanese for example there's like three languages literally in one sentence um and then in Chinese it's like very like what you know like what Kevin was saying like very ideogrammatic it's more like reading a painting than like reading a sentence um and then French and English Latin based languages like you're like inflicting a lot you're disrupting it essentially like with these rhythms imposing periods and or like not periods but like imposing ups and downs where you wouldn't impose them so I'm interested in the ways that like these different languages that you speak um, and the way that you write poetry through these languages, like, is that something you think about? Uh, disruption, yes. Um, that's a good question because um, Disruption, absolutely, because um, uh, I think language is a place where you 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 can you can speak yourself into being, right? Where you're where you emerge when you speak, um, when you write, and um, the question for me is always, how am I going to emerge and what am I going to look like and what am I going to sound and read like um, when I start writing? And um, coming from partly a Caribbean background, um, um, a background against which the English language might have been deployed, against which uh, it, it, that was upon which the English language was imposed. Um, there's no easy way, there's no easy relationship with the English or the French language, right? Like I would, you know, they're colonial languages and they were imposed and the African languages were disappeared. Um, so um, how does one relate to those languages when they're what you have to communicate? And sometimes what you might want to communicate, um, you don't even know what it is because it exceeds, it's outside of those languages. So, um, there's a lot of, of, of tension. Um, language itself becomes the battleground. Um, you know, there's a lot of tension with the language and you can't, you can't ever really break a language, but you can, you can test it, you can bend it, you can um, attempt to, um, um, you, can you can create tensions within your relationship to the language or you can illustrate those, um, you know, and, Sometimes there is, you know, they, in that thing that I, they, they quote, the kind of essay poem, I, there's a, I quoted the poet Kemal Brathwaite, who says, uh, the hurricane does not roar in pentameters. And that's, a, I, I repeat that quote all the time, because it, it, it can mean so much in so many different circumstances. But essentially, I think where it comes from is Brathwaite was saying that, um, um, for a Caribbean, for poets from the Caribbean to write in a way that mimics the rhythms of the Queen's English um, is really not appropriate because if you want to, 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 to come into being and into existence through the use of language, um, you want to draw your language and your references and your sounds from the things within your environment that shape your reality. Right. And if the hurricane is something that exists in the Caribbean and that shapes the realities of people in the Caribbean, well, the hurricane doesn't sound in the da 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 Right. And so, I mean, I don't come from the Caribbean, although I have ties to it, but I do feel that my attempt is to speak my own history and not just oneself, but one's history and family and ancestry into being, um, and to discover 
um, or to attempt to uncover what that sounds like. And that can't, it's not going to be the Queen's English. It's not going to be, um, uh, the rhythms are going to be disruptive. Um, they're going to be um, difficult at times. Um, but, but, you know, to something that both of you were mentioning earlier, um, Quinn, you were talking about uh, hip hop and sampling and, um, uh, and Le, you were talking also about, um, we were talking earlier about some of the qualities of visual poetry, Kevin Lowe's visual poetry and how the, there's sometimes these degraded letter images. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that's, um, that I like um, is a kind of graininess or roughness in the language. Um, uh, and in the poem or the story overall, I also want a kind of ragged edge, right? I don't want it to be too precious um, and too carefully poised and refined, right? Like I want, I certainly want people to be able to perceive all of the formal and structural qualities at work and 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 you know to be able to see how I can use my literary devices and so on and so forth, right? But I also want, at the end of the day, I want a roughness um, to be there, a raggedness to be there, um, an unfinished quality, perhaps. Um, I don't want it to be to to feel like it's completely polished and finished and closed, and so. Um, I will polish it very hard so that it seems unpolished. You know what I mean? Like you work really hard to make something seem like it's like <laughs> disheveled, right? Um, yeah. Oh, but you cool. know, that, that, that grainy quality is also what you get from sampling because there's a different texture of sound when you pull something off of a particular record that was, you know, you might be producing a song in 1980 or 1992, right? But the record you're pulling one sample off was produced in 1972, and you're pulling another sample off a record produced in 1968, and another sample off a record produced in 1989. They also have different sounds, different kinds of studio production values went into them, right? So it gives all of these different uneven textures of sound. And that's really interesting. Um, it gives that, that, that kind of roughness gets built into the sound. And that's, um, I, I love that quality. Mm. Well, sweet. Yeah, thank you for, I, I mean, I was sort of just trying to make up my point about the hip hop thing and not really knowing if hip hop was the specific thing, but yeah, thank you for, for including that and, and sort of reflecting on that. Um, Cause I definitely think I, I enjoy that sort of like that roughness in the poetry that you write and can also understand how that would probably take a bit to get the point out, but also cut it back a bit. Like just that editing to, to make it seem effortless is, is, is very interesting to hear about. Um, I don't wanna, we're at time, I think. Um, so unless anyone else has anything else they'd like to say to wrap up, I think, or unless Kai, if you have anything else you'd like to add before we close off, but. Um, Does Patrick have a question? Um, I think you're muted. Sorry, I was unmute. unmute. Uh, I was mute. Uh, so, uh, not really a question, but I hope that uh, Kaye will feel it's all right if I keep stalking him uh, on, on social media and uh, keep listening and uh, hearing. Yeah, please do keep listening. <laughs> I, I love your poetry. It's mm -hmm. so nice. and. And I, I really enjoyed it when it was in text form, but something extra really added when when I saw first saw the YouTube clips and uh, when I um, listened to you earlier on, I, I can't recall when you, it was when you were in, at Queens. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll put a link uh, in the uh, in the chat. Uh, hang on. Um, I think that's the right link. Um, yeah, so if, if anyone's interested, you can look at that. It's sort of a collaboration. And I'm in the process of doing one now. Um, it might be disrupted by COVID, but um, it's a six piece ensemble plus Kevin doing visual projections. And the link I just sent you, Le, is also has Kevin's projections. Um, right. 
And uh, Kevin is a designer. We both know a, a type, a type and visual design. But um, yeah, we're working on a, a, a seven-piece band, um, six-piece band plus one designer collaboration. Um, and uh, we're about to go into. I was re rehearsing. We started rehearsing yesterday. Um, so um, hopefully that'll be out. Um, it's for a festival called um, Jazz Ahead Bremen. Um, and so it's going to be filmed and it will be um, shown at different jazz festivals. Um, so hopefully it'll be out there to, to see. Great. But I yeah. Hope, just... and I, I, hope, I hope I will uh, uh, manage to... Um, uh, to get people, more people in Sweden to, to, to know your work and invite you to festivals when, when we can have festivals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we can have them again. <laughs> well, thank you. That's very generous. <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, it's, it's just egoistic because I want to hear you live. I, I would love to come. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I will double check. I think we're, we're recording all of this, and, which is really great. I think I was just thinking um, it's close to Easter. Lots of people who seemed interested on Facebook, I'm sure would have loved to have been here, but also people's energy levels and stuff are, uh, it's the end of the week. It's almost the holiday. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, Kai. Too. Exactly. Zoomed, zoomed. Exactly. Um, I'm wondering if we are recording still. I'm wondering if, if you'll if you're all right with us by posting this to YouTube, maybe for a couple of weeks, doesn't have to live on the internet forever, but uh, at least gives some people another chance to see the presentation at the start, if that's sure. all right. Be, okay. Yeah, give it a temporary post, that's cool. Sweet, uh, I'm gonna stop recording now. So thank you Kai again for showing up um, and for everyone who watched this after the fact, this is really sweet. Um,